The message is called, Who Are You Choosing to Trust? Let's all stand up and read Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 5 to 8. This is what the Lord says, Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wasteland. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert, in a salt land where no one lives. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in Him. It will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when the heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in the year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Amen. When we are born, We don't choose. Anybody? When we are born, we don't choose who we're going to trust to. When we are born, we have no choice. We are helpless. We can't move. We can't eat by ourselves. We can't even wipe the poop by ourselves without any help from any adults. We don't choose who we're going to trust. As infants develop, they trust their parents absolutely and unconditionally. When Daniel was 3, 4, 5, he thought I was like Superman. Daniel thought I knew everything, that, that I was so strong, as you can tell, I'm not that strong, but he thought I was really strong, that I, that, that I was the smartest, he thought I knew everything. But now he knows, of course, I'm not a superman. He knows right now, I'm not even that strong. Actually, he challenges me now, you know, to a wrestling match all the time. Uh, he knows I'm not the smartest. You know, some, he knows that sometimes I fail that I don't always do what's right all the time, that I'm imperfect. He knows that, and he's only 10, you know. He's got eight more years before he, you know, leaves the house. But there's one thing that's unchanging, and that's his knowledge, his confidence that he could trust me, right? Daniel trusts me now as he has ever trusted me. It's not a trust that I'm always right. It's not a trust that, that I'm always perfect. But it's a trust that I love him more than anything else in the world. Maybe except for God and his mom. It's a trust that everything that I do for him, I do because I love him. That trust remains now and forever will remain with him. But really recently, I see that he's becoming more and more self-aware, self-centered, self-accommodating. His sin nature is starting to assert itself. And I can see it. When I ask Daniel to do something that he doesn't want to do, he gives me that look and said, why? Actually, he says, really? I'm like, yeah, really. It's not that he doesn't trust me, that, he's prob that I'm asking him to do something because it's probably good for him, but he just doesn't want to do it. It's the self that's coming up inside of him. Of course, when I put him to bed at about 
we, and when we talk about this, he'll say, okay, Dad, I'm sorry. You know, that wasn't really me. He said, I know, it's not really you, it's the other you. You know, I, I totally understand. <laughs> But as he grows, as his self grows, he's self that wants to do what he wants to do. He's self that wants to be that wants to be the God of his life. There will also grow instinctively the desire to resist anything that is contrary to his desires. This is not a breakdown of his trust for me. He will always have his trust for me. It's a breakdown of his self-control. To do what he knows is the right thing to do. This is a breakdown of him not trusting what he knows, but being persuaded by his feelings and his emotions. This is unconsciously accepting his natural desire for self-autonomy, self-rule. This is the beginning symptoms of trusting in himself above all else. Not because he's right, but because he wants to. Now I'm thinking all of you in here, to a certain degree, is going through the same thing. You want to do something, and it overrules what you know to be right. You trust your parents, and you know that whatever they're telling you is the right thing. But sometimes you just don't want to do it, because you want to do what you want to do. It's making you rebel against your parents. Now, most of you are at an age when you know that your parents are not perfect. Maybe not even close. But nevertheless, nonetheless, you know that you can trust them to love you. And know that they always have the best intentions for you. This trust is timeless because this trust is based on love. It's not going to change. But how about your trust of God? Do you trust God as much as you trust your parents? Do you trust the God with the self, same kind of confidence, with the same kind of absoluteness that you trust your parents with? Now when it comes to trusting God, <coughs> the response will depend on whether you're a Christian or not, right? Because if you're not a Christian, will you be trusting God for anything? Probably not. If you are a Christian, then the existence of God, the goodness of God, the desirability of God is assumed, and the question will focus on your heart and your will. It's the question of whether you will choose to, <coughs> whether you will choose to trust God to be the God of your life, or you will choose to trust yourself to be the God of your life. It is your choice. It is your will. Now, if you are not a Christian yet, if you haven't fully devoted yourself to God, if you're not actually sure about God, or if you don't believe in God, then trusting God must start with the question of the existence of God. So before I continue with what it means to trust God as a Christian, for any who would be non-Christians in the room, or for you to be aware of, I'm going to briefly discuss how you should approach a question of the existence of God. Now the incorrect way of questioning the existence of God is to start with the default position that God doesn't exist, and demanding someone to prove that God exists. Understand? It's like, okay, God doesn't exist. It's the fact. Prove me wrong. This is an incorrect 
position. Why? Because assuming the non-existence of God is really not evidence-based. After all, if non-existence of God was proved, then all the scientists and most intellectual people would be atheists. But as we have discussed time and time again through our apologetics, there are about equal number of scientists on both sides with renowned Nobel Prize winners on both sides. <coughs> this incorrectness can be easily seen if we reverse the argument. If a Christian says, I know that God exists, prove to me that God doesn't exist. Can anybody prove to you that God doesn't exist? Of course not. So what is the correct way the correct way is as much as possible, look at the evidence and determine which way the evidence is pointing. If you are arguing for God not existing, if you know people, if you are not sure, and you have friends who are arguing that God does not exist, then they need to pursue questions and answers about their atheism. After all, that's what they're trying to prove. Criticizing Christianity does not prove atheism. Many atheists have this kind of a confusion that if I criticize Christianity, it proves my atheism. No. You need to prove your atheism to yourself first. And these are the questions that you should be pursuing. How does something come from nothing? That's the first thing. Or more accurately, how did everything that we are knowledgeable, knowledgeable about come into existence when the universe is believed to have had a beginning where there was nothing before that, not even matter, not even space, not even time, just nothing. What is the probability of the universe exploding in such a precise manner to create a universe like ours? Non-Christian scientists have estimated the chance to be so great as to exceed the number of atoms in the universe. Now that's a very, it's not even a chance, it's an impossibility. What is the probability of lifeless things like a rock evolving into a living, breathing, reproducing organisms like us? These are the questions for people who want to believe that there is no such thing as God and everything is just chance. This is what they must answer for themselves first. Now, if you are a Christian, and you know that you can and should not only trust that God loves you, but that you can trust Him to love you and save you perfectly, are you trusting in God right now? If you're sitting here, and you are saying, I'm a Christian. Are you choosing to trust God or are you trusting yourself? When you make a decision, do you think about, is this what God wants or do you think about, is this what I want? Today's scripture tells us this, cursed is the one who trusts in man. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. Okay, again, cursed is the one who trusts in man, but blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. Everyone who trusts in man, including himself or herself, is cursed because why? Man is mortal. We're finite. We're limited. As we say, we are only men. We are only people. We make mistakes. 
We don't know what's in our future. If I say, I trust in myself, if I trust some other man, if I trust some philosopher, some scientist, who are just man just like me, what does that trust get you? We are people who bring nothing into this world and we die and we leave with nothing. Proverbs 3, 5 through 7 tells us this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to Him and He will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. A lot of us, believe it or not, think we know better than a lot of other people. And what Bible tells you is, don't fool yourself. Don't trust yourself. Trust me. You know the Noah's Ark, right? Noah's Ark is missing two basic components that are needed in any ship. You know what they are? Does anybody know? Noah's Ark is missing two things. It's missing a rudder, and it's missing a sail. So basically, you're not, you can't control where it's going to go. When Noah got into that ark, what he's saying is, God, you have the help. Wherever you lead, that's where I'm going to go. I'm not going to control this ark. You are going to control this ark. You as Christians, when you step into the ark of God, when you step into the life of Christianity, when you step into being with Jesus Christ, that has to be you. I'm not going to control my life. You, Lord, I put all of my trust on you. For all of the teachers in here who has jobs, who has family, who has adult worries, let's say, are you trusting in God? Are you trusting God with everything that you have? And for the youth, or like to you who's going to be going to college next year, and you guys who's, going, who's studying really hard to go to college, are you trying to control your destiny, your future? Or are you saying, I am going to trust who? I'm going to trust the Lord. I'm not going to lean on my own understanding. As I end today, I want to tell you this. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Do not think of yourself more than you should. Trust one person who deserves to be trusted. The almighty, omnipresent, omniscient God. Every day when you make decisions, every morning when you get up, commit to yourself, Lord, today, help me to abide in you and trust in you with every single one of my decisions, Lord. Help me not to be a fool by thinking I'm so smart or so wise, thinking I know best for my life. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I pray before you, Lord. We're living in a generation 